seated and somebody shout hallelujah for me. Hallelujah. Amen. Great. God bless you and welcome to the house of the Lord today. Amen. As many as you know, Brother Harden passed away uh, Monday night about 1030 and so uh, pray for his wife and family and ask God to strengthen them in this time of loss. Amen. Don't forget about our prayer walk again, June the 4th. That's a Saturday morning. And then revival starts on the field from Brother Sister Shepherd. Amen. I'm thankful for the blessings of the Lord today. Amen. Amen. God is good to us. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Can we put our hands together and give the Lord a hand of praise? Let's sing to Him. Hallelujah.
what we're looking ahead. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. It was a command of the Lord to Lot and his family not to dwell in the plain or to look back. Amen. I don't have no thoughts of looking back. Praise God. Because it's sweet to trust in Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand. Praise God. And let's sing along with Sister Alexis singing this soul chorus. Amen. Share with you about prayer. Amen. 
And um, there are what they would call connective mm -hmm. tissues that bind our physical bodies together to keep them strong. And there are some connectives to prayer that will make it strong and more effective. And without these, I think that we will establish in this lesson that without these connectives, they will be powerless and weak. And offered with these connectives, our prayer life and our prayers become more powerful force in the life of you and I today. And so I would like to embark on this journey of talking about some things that needs to go in alignment with our prayer. One of those things that needs to be in alignment with our prayers is obedience. Everybody say obedience. Obedience. And I guess one of the most renowned verses that uh, speaks concerning obedience is there when Saul, as you well know, came back from the battle and the Lord had instructed Saul through the prophet to uh, slay all the Amalekites and Agag and all of these. And so uh, we would find that they uh, uh, refused. Now, I'm sure there's different schools of thoughts on uh, all the particular details, but one thing Saul replied was that the people, the people influenced him. And uh, it leads us to know that uh, people should not influence us to go trump contrary to what the Lord says. Amen. To what the word of the Lord is. Amen. Amen. There's too many folks today that's wound up spiritual shipwrecked because they allowed people to influence them in disobeying the word of the Lord. Amen. I, I'm not saying here that uh, if you obey God, things will automatically be <coughs> rosy because that's not necessarily the case. Right, right. But it, it, is the, it is the end that's what we're focusing on, not the present. It's not how we feel right now. It's how we end up is what we must be concerned sure. with. Amen. And so we know that to <laughs> disobey God may give us a temporary reprieve at the moment. It may get things off of our back and out of our lives. But when we come to the end of life and we have to give an account for everything that we've done and we've said, <coughs> and when we're just, amen, <coughs> seconds from our eternal abode, we're going to wish that we could retrace our tracks and, amen, obey God rather than man. Amen? amen. amen. Hallelujah. So Saul refused it, and, and Samuel asked him concerning what is that I hear. And uh, he said, Saul, what you need to understand is that <coughs> obedience is better than sacrifice. He he tried to build a case for his obedience by the merits of sacrificing the best to God. But that didn't jive with the Lord. The Lord wants people to obey him. Amen. 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 So when we will couple prayer and obedience, our prayers are not going to go anywhere. They're not going to be any account or powerful if we are living a life in continued disobedience. Him that knoweth to do good, and what doeth not to him is what? It's sin. Disobedience to God and his word destroys the desired results from our prayers. But obedience to God is the key factor or the key to answered prayers. There's a couple of things I'd like to bring out Concerning prayer and obedience is out of the book of Acts, chapters 9 and chapters 10. We will find that in chapter 9 is the conversion of, of, of the man named of Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Later on to be known Paul, the probably the greatest and the powerfulest of all the apostles 
and greater, and, and definitely the greater writer that contributed more to the New Testament writing than anyone else. We find that the Lord said to Ananias in the 11th verse, a preacher there in the city of Damascus, he said, I want you to arise. And while we flow through this particular story, I want you to notice that there are two men, Saul and Ananias, and both of these men, you can find them connected to prayer and to obedience, that they both are uh, interweaving uh, in this story that these both of these men, they pray and they are obedient. And so he said to Ananias, Arise and go into the streets, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. Everybody say, He prayeth. He prayeth. Now he's praying. He's been struck down, as you well know. He's blind. They had to physically lead him into the city. And there he's in this house and he's. He's in darkness. He is blind. And we find that the Lord tells Ananias that, and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias. He's seen you coming in, putting his hands on him that he might receive his sight. Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to the, thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Amen. For I will shew him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And now Ananias, he's become obedient. Saul's praying, but Ananias is becoming obedient. He went his way and entered to the house, putting his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thy camest, hath sent me, that thou mayest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith. And arose and was baptized. So Saul's praying. But now after this preacher comes to him. And he sees and understands that God has allowed this vision to come to pass. That Saul becomes obedient. And he is now being baptized. Amen. The greatest combination that you can have in your life is one of obedience and prayers. Praying to God. Seeking God and being obedient to Him. Both of these men were obedient to the voice of God. And therefore, we will find that this is the beginning of the Apostle Paul's life. Amen. As one of that were in the way in Jesus a man has uh, showed him what he's going to have to encounter as an apostle or as a believer. But yet we find that he's a man, one of the most renowned a man, men that is described in the New Testament book of Acts. His name is dominant, a man, from about chapter 9 here, 10 all the way to the end. Prior to that, Peter's kind of the forefront man. But now because of prayer and obedience, we would find here that Saul has been converted. Now he'd go by the name Paul. And there's something special. Oh, God, help us to be willing to obey the voice and the Spirit of God, the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You and I understood that if we were going to get anything from God, we had to come in obedience. 
And if that's the way we got started, tell me, tell me how can we alter that line of thinking. If obedience is how we got started, I'm sure obedience is how we must continue today. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. We need folks to learn how. For we would find the New Testament declared that the Lord himself learned obedience and learned suffering through the death of the cross. He become obedient, praise God, to the mission that was labeled for him when he first came into this earth. Give us folks all across this congregation that can understand I must be obedient to him. Everybody say obedient. obedient. Then we find in the book of Acts chapter 10, this deals with Carnelius. Verse 4, it said, when he looked on him, he was afraid. This is Carnelius seeing the angel. What is it, Lord? And the Lord said unto him, thy prayers and thy alms are come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth one, one Simon, a tanner whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughts to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually and he declared all these things unto them and he sent them to Joppa. Again, there are two men that are primary figures in this 10th chapter, Peter and Cornelius. Again, here are two men that are, a man become, are in prayer. It was already stated that Cornelius was a man of prayer and his prayers became as a moral. But when you find that Peter goes to the housetop, he goes up to pray. And there on that housetop, he sees a uh, vision. And it's a vision that troubles him. And at the beginning, he refused to obey the voice. But after a while, he recanted. Here we find that Cornelius gets a visitation from an angel. And here the angel said, go and bring Peter to your house. And, and there we would now find that uh, Cornelius is obedient to that heavenly vision. And he goes and he sends men to bring Peter back to his house. And we understand that it was, amen, all finally settled and done. And you know what? His house, him and his whole household, amen, received the gospel, received the Holy Ghost. It amen. fell on them while Peter was preaching. Why? It's because there was men and women that prayed and were obedient. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise yes. God. God's not going to move, amen, in the heart of rebellion. God's not going to, God is not going to try to come over Amen. Uh, and uh, and bring down and work over rebellion. You know what he's going to do with rebellion? He's going to meet it face to face. And he's going to confront it. Amen. And he's going to deal with it. And you and I better not be, amen, in that midst of those that rebel. Because everywhere you find in the Word of God, amen, that folks that continue to rebel and would not repent, God sent judgment to them. I said God sent judgment to them. It yeah. fell on them. Oh, God, give me an obedient heart. Amen. Help me to examine myself. If my prayers are not going up and being answered, maybe I need to examine myself and check and see if I've got an obedient heart. Amen. Didn't Jesus give a parable of a man that had two sons, and he asked his, his eldest son, said, would you go out and work in the field, do X, et cetera, et cetera? And he said, yeah. But the Bible said he went out, but he didn't do it. He went and asked his youngest son, said, would you go do it? And he said, no, I don't want to do it, you know. And so he began to argue with father. Finally, he recanted, repented, and went and done it. Which one done? 
Amen. The one that said I'd do it. Amen. Vocally and verbally, and but yet, amen, in actions, he didn't do it. Or mm -hmm. the one that began to wrestle and fight and resist the will of God. And finally he repented and recanted and said, I'll do it, and went and done it. Amen. It's not necessary what we say we're going to do. It's what we do. do. That makes the difference. Amen. Praise God. We're living in a, as you well know, we're living in a, in a trying hour. And the Paul said it was a time that would be perilous uh, times that would come upon the face of the earth and help us to understand that the Lord needs men and women that are obedient to him, obedient to his word. Yes, you cannot be obedient to God and not be obedient to what this Bible says, what is instructed to, to tell you. <laughs> and so we would find here that this world is lost and we need a, a, an end time revival. Amen. <laughs> so won't you and I begin to praise God, pray and be obedient to what God wants us to do. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Sometimes what God instructs us, us to do doesn't sound rational or reasonable. Hallelujah. Amen. amen. Yeah. It sounds, amen, very, it's very contradictory to the flesh. To the flesh. Right? Even after you and I have come to God and got the Holy Ghost, uh, there are things that God impresses upon us to do, but Amen. What what a great what a great testimony. I told this the other uh, some time back, and and uh, I seen where they reprinted this in a periodical concerning uh, Sister Freeman years ago, prior to them going to Africa on their missionary endeavors. That as she was standing in the house uh, washing dishes at this particular time. The Lord impressed upon her to go and stand in the front porch. They lived right beside a main artery going into the little town that they pastored in. And she wrestled and argued, Lord, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. I've got dishes to wash. I've got dinner to cook. I've got... She just began to... Get, just like the Lord didn't know what she had to do. That's the way we do it. Amen. We instruct God. We inform Him just like He don't know. He's blinded. The one that declared the end from the beginning, we've got to tell it. So she said, it, 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 it's not, it's, Lord, amen, not only do I have a lot to do, but, you know, what's the neighbors going to say? Housewife, standing on the front porch doing nothing. And so finally she repented and went out and stood and she looked around and she didn't, all of a sudden she heard this car coming in. She saw the man, she knew him just kind of by occasion, you know, and knew his name, but that's about all. And she just waved at him, smiled and waved. Mm -hmm. She waved and smiled at him the whole, the longest that she could see. She smiled and waved and went back. Yeah. And she thought, now that's really foolish. That was really dumb. I hope nobody saw me waving this thing. And so we would find that, Amen. They're wrestling in there. They got wrestling in there. Praise God. The meanest one ain't even back there. Praise God. And so uh, she went back and finished out the day. Several years passed by. She was on furlough. She was back in that little town and uh, had preached that morning and done her uh, deputation work. And uh, so here come this man. She knew him. If I remember the name is correct, it was O.C. Taylor. And she saw him coming, said tears. And just She said, or he said, Sister Freeman, he's several years while y'all was here in Rose Pine, Pastor, do you remember you standing out on the front porch and I drove by and I, you waved at me. And you just smiled and waved and waved and waved. She said, yeah, I, I remember that. I do remember that. He said, what you don't understand, said I had lost my job and, 
In fact, I'd lost several jobs and it just, things were bad and, and uh, I was driving towards what they call a gravel pit where they dug gravel up out of the ground and said on the side of that seat that you couldn't see was a pistol. And I was so depressed and despondent that I was going to end my life because I, it just seemed like I couldn't get a job and lost my life more. But when you stood out, I drove up, and when I was getting in, and you was getting in my vision, I could see you standing there, and you began to wave. And I thought, here's that Pentecostal preacher's wife waving. She said, he said, it looked like you cared. And said, instead of going down to the pit, ending my life, I went and seen a man about a job and got hired on. And said, not only that, I've got the Holy Ghost since you've been gone. Amen. Because somebody obedient to the Spirit of the Lord, the prompting of God. Amen. Amen. You know what she was doing? She didn't understand, but she was reaching for a soul. She was reaching for somebody that she just knew on an occasion and never dreamed at that moment that when she was obedient to God, amen, re regardless of how ridiculous it looked like, that man was in the throes of hell and just moments probably from going to hell, but somebody obeyed God. Hallelujah. What it looked like to that man, what it looked like to Nona Freeman was foolishness, but what it looked like to that man that was despondent, somebody came. Amen. God got man. Oh, I want to tell you, thank God. He can cause our past to cross with somebody and we can be a witness to them. I said we can be a light to them. Amen. Hallelujah. We may not look like it to us. Amen. But what we think don't really matter. It's what God thinks. And the end results is what matters. It's the saving of a soul. It's the rescue. It's as Luke said, pluck the brain from a burning house. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It's snatching them out of the snare of the fowler because of a lot of folks that's dying and going to hell. Amen. Oh, we could be, amen, the part of that mechanism uh, that, is, uh, that will save them, that will bring them to Christ. Amen. Then we find another connective is the prayer and the armor of God. The effectiveness of the armor is obtained through prayer. An inseparable bond exists between prayer and the armor of God. In Ephesians 6, 10, 18, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And if you'll see there, he's connecting, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. There is something about it when we put on the armor, we must saturate it with prayer, with prayer. Here I'd like to put a footnote in and let you know that sometimes we do, amen. Paul said that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. In other words, it's not the flesh and blood that is our primary foe. But he begins to describe what our primary foal is, his principalities and his powers and rulers. Everybody say rulers. Rulers, rulers of the darkness of this world and the spiritual wickedness in high places. 
Amen. And I thank you and I can understand and see more prevalent than any other generation that there are spiritual wickedness in high places all over this world today. Amen. Oh, saints, help me. Help me. Help me preach to you and teach that we need this business of prayer. Amen. It's nothing wrong with socializing with one another in fellowship. But it should be, amen, a priority behind prayer. We shouldn't socialize or talk until we have prayed and talked to God. Amen. And sing to it. We come to church. Amen. We need to find some time to pray. Saturate our mind with prayer. Amen. 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 Praise God. We need to get in there. Amen. If you can get yourself into that, into that habit and ritual, it's our duty to pray. If the church don't pray, who will pray? Amen. If the church don't stand fast and put on the whole armor, who's going to stand fast and put on the whole armor? Amen. If the church don't stand against principalities, against powers and rulers of darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness, high places, if we don't do it, who will? Amen. If not us, who will? If yeah. not now, when? Yeah. Amen. When will we do yeah. it? Praise yeah. God. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, if you'll start praying when you begin to start walking with God, amen, you're going to find yourself growing stronger. Yeah. Hallelujah. You don't have to be at the church. You can go anywhere to pray. Yeah. Amen. But the Bible, let me go back to Ananias. The Bible, or Peter, the Bible said he went up to the top. At the sixth hour, chapter 3, the Bible said that Peter and John going to the temple at the hour of prayer being the third hour. Praise God. Uh, Jesus went off into the uh, mountain to pray. Amen. They asked him, will you teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray? And Paul, amen, talks about, amen, nearly every letter that he wrote to a church, uh, he informed them, in some degree, I'm praying for you. He talked about weeping and, and great tears for church Amen. Oh, God, give us some folks that knows how to pray. They prayed and the place was shaken where they were assembled. Amen. I'm telling you, there's power in prayer. There's power in prayer. Hallelujah. You can't go wrong with communicating with the master. Amen. You need to build that fellowship up with Jesus through prayer. Prayer is your lifeline. Hallelujah. So God help us today to pray. See these connectives. You need to have prayer. Prayer alone is powerful. But there, you're going to find here there's things that needs to come along and connect with prayer. Another great connective is faith. Prayer and faith. Amen. Doubt will reduce the most sincere prayer to an ineffective request. It is the prayer of faith, according to James 5, 14 through 18, that saves the sick. The prayer of what? The prayer of faith. The prayer, say that. The, the prayer of faith. faith. Say it again. The prayer of faith. Say it again. The prayer of faith. Hallelujah. And no one in this building, no one, look at me, no one in this building ought to discount their prayer and say, well, mine don't mean nothing. You don't know. You may have that faith that's needed at that moment. Yeah. Now, this is, this is just the pastor, but I think that there are times that people have faith rises up in them for a particular mission or a moment or time. Right. Yeah. And they may not have it again, right. but at that particular time, they had that faith. Yes. Yes. Amen. And you don't need to discount because that may be the moment that God's going to use your prayer and use your faith. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Because he saw their faith. When they tore the roof down and let the man down that was sick of a palsy in his bed, he didn't see the man's faith. He didn't, he didn't acknowledge the man's faith. I don't know whether the man had any faith or not. 
It don't say nothing about the man's faith. But it did say the four men, the four that bore him, he saw their faith. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. So you may need to come and pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Pray for that one at that time. Folks, prayer is powerful as it's coupled with faith. This is how Jesus described it. In Matthew 21, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do to this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye will say unto this mountain, and did you get did you get what happened here? He had just cursed the fig tree. And now they're standing at this fig tree, but 24 hours prior, he come back and he said, it had leaves but no figs. It was just a show. No fruit. He cursed it. 24 hours, now they're standing back at the tree. It's dead. It's dead. Things in the black kingdom don't die that quick, but it died. It died right then because God placed judgment on it. Yeah. Now, but notice here, he says, now, if you have faith and doubt not, not only you can do this, which is done to the fig tree, but ye shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and it shall be done. He went from a fig tree to a mountain. He went from a fig tree to a mountain. But it all had to do with faith. Amen. Faith. The Father said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Amen. So faith is something that you and I need to couple with our prayers. We need that. And another connected, I think, is very powerful. And that is simply persistence. We need folks that are persistent in praying. So often we pray briefly and without persistence, manifesting to God the unimportance of the request. The continuing asking is important and biblical because in 11 of Luke, Five and eight through ten, he said unto them, Which of you have a friend shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. Verse eight, I say unto you, Though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. Verse nine, I say unto you, Ask, it shall be given. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asked, asketh, receiveth, and he that seeketh, findeth, and to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. So we find here that he was persistent. He was not embarrassed to keep praying. God help us today to understand that, that the Lord, that rather this, this kingdom needs men and women that is persistent in their prayer. And I know there's folks here tonight under the sound of my voice has been praying. No doubt. No doubt. You haven't said anything, but I just know human nature. I know people that you've been praying a while for something. But I've only come to stand here before you to let you know that you don't need to quit. And you don't need to be weakened. But you need to keep praying. Amen. Hallelujah. Can we clap our hands this afternoon and give God some praise? Come on, let's give him some praise. I sound redundant, but if you don't pray, who's going to pray for them? Right. Who's going to pray for that situation? Yes. Amen. And we need, amen, the, the Bible speaks about, hallelujah, praying and praying without ceasing. Amen. Samuel told them in 1 Samuel 12, 22 and 23, he said this is concerning about asking a king for the Lord will not forsake his people. For his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord 
and ceasing to pray for you. But I would teach you the good in the right way. Could it be a connection if we fail to pray and fail to be persistent that we could be sinning against the Lord? God forbid, Samuel said, I should sin against him in ceasing to pray for you. Amen. Romans 1, 9. Paul said, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing... I make mention of you always in my prayers. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, it just simply says pray without ceasing. Oh, God. Amen. Somebody says, well, how can that be done? Just march on and pray. Keep on praying. Paul said, I, I will not cease to make mention of you always in prayers. As I mentioned before, he was constantly, amen, letting them know. I don't think he was bragging on himself. I was thinking he was trying to encourage them. Somebody's got your back. Somebody's got your back. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. Somebody's got your back. Amen. I'm calling you. I'm calling you. Pray. Hallelujah, because a lot of these saints and in these letters that he wrote to, many of them were are fading such a pagan, rich society. Uh -huh. That's right. Amen. Amen. Not that, that it's not that they knew anything about God. They were way away from God, much less this Jesus who they was talking about. Just read there in the book of, of Acts where Paul was at Mars Hill, and you know he he said, I perceive that you are much uh, superstitious and, uh, and you've got an inscription to an unknown God. That's the guy I want to talk to you about. Yeah, yeah. That's the one I want to talk to you about. Amen. That's the one I want to preach to you about. Amen. Amen. Him, I know. You may not know him. You, he may be unknown to you, but I know him because his spirit is in me. Praise God. Hallelujah. Come on, help us. You need to get this. We need to be praying, and we need to pray without ceasing. Hallelujah. Amen. We need prayer repetitively, and this is not to be mistaken with vain repetition. Vain repetition is saying the same things over and over and insincerely for the sake of making long prayers. But you'll find Jesus prayed three times one night and said the same things according to the written word. Elijah prayed seven times in succession for rain. So asking repeatedly for something isn't wrong if we are sincere. It is the will of God and not unscriptural. So don't let that guilt trip play on you anymore. You get that off of you right now. And don't you let flesh or the or guilt, or the whatever, whoever, amen. You just tell them, I'm amen. scriptural, I've been praying, and I'll yes. continue to pray. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm not going to quit. We need to be persistent. There's a word that describes how uh, Elijah prayed. James records it as he prayed earnestly, earnestly. There's a lot of different ways that you could describe the word earnestly, but I'd like I like the word also sincerely. He was earnest. He was earnest. He was, I mean, he was taken in by it. Praise God. You ever seen small children at at the toy store, the toy aisle? Man, they just, boy, they were just really there. They're glued in on it. They, amen. They just. Or we could get to the bigger, bigger boys and go to the sports good and the bass boats and you know, on four wheel drives and man they just glued to it man they're earnestly, amen into it. James or James said Elijah prayed earnestly. You know, you need to understand that when you read about Elijah praying for that rain, you know it just it wasn't long, it wasn't deep, but it was earnest and. And um, uh, 
We don't know how long he prayed in between the times that the prophet sent the servant up there. Praise God. But he kept praying earnestly. And the James would again say, uses the word, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The word effectual is from a Greek word meaning to be active, efficient, or mighty in. The word fervent comes from a Greek word meaning heat, zeal. It's fiery. Now, sometimes you're not going to be fiery in prayer, but sometimes you're going to have to be fiery. You're going to have to be effectual, active, mighty in it. You're going to have to get into it. This is where I'm trying to get you to go to another level with these three nights, uh, three Wednesday nights of turning to prayer. You, you, sometimes you have got to turn, put the foot on the metal, so to speak. We, we wonder why God ain't answering our prayers. It may be that we're not deeply engaged. We're going through motions. We're not, amen, spiritually and emotionally connected with him. Yeah. Amen. amen. Praise God. Somehow if we could get, 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 get disconnected with the world. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Amen. That's right. Amen. In the electrical world, they have a disconnect. I was talking to someone the other day, and it might have been today, and they was telling me about a building, and, and, and it's, a, it's a code that now that you have to have a disconnect on commercial properties right beside where the meter base is at. When there's, it happened to be a fire, uh, the fireman could go immediately turn that off. Amen. And cut all the fire off in the building. From that point, there's too many folks that got a disconnect and the devil has turned it off. Yeah. There's nothing inside. There ain't no juice flowing inside. Oh, God help us today. Hey, Amen. You know what we need? We need to turn that thing back on in our prayer life. Yeah. You can pray. You can pray. And you can be a prayer warrior. You can pray in the Holy Ghost. Now, this is one that we all enjoy. We, we, we just jump in at the bits to do this. This is where we like. This is what we like. We, this is what we want to connect with prayer. And that is fasting. <laughs> See, there, I, I knew everyone would jump to your feet. <laughs> we understand what Jesus said in Mark 9. Amen. About, man, this only comes by prayer and feisting. They asked him, why couldn't we cast the devil out? This come forth by nothing but prayer and feisting. Yeah. The Bible said in Acts 14, 23, that when they had ordained elders in every church and had prayed with feisting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you're just going to have to shove the plate aside. You're going to have to shove th some things aside. You don't, and I'm going to tell you, you just keep putting it off and you keep putting it off and next thing you know, you're going to realize there's been weeks, months, maybe years since you've ever sacrificed for the Lord. Well, Pastor, I'm going to tell you something the fasting business is, is like a lot of other things. You have to sometimes work into it. Yeah. <laughs> Heavy coffee drinkers sometimes have to start just letting the coffee go prior to getting fasting because without food and caffeine, bam, man, you're, you're out of sight. Sometimes you just got to start fasting the breakfast. A few days, fast breakfast and lunch. And then a few days, week, all three meals. And just too many folks that goes into this fast business. And that, I mean, they, you know, fad diet, just Christ diets. You don't need to do that. If you, if you will fast one day a week, that's 52 days in a year. 
that is over a month of fasting in one year. Feist, feisting brings this flesh and nails him to the cross and crucifies him. And no flesh wants to be crucified. Even the flesh of Jesus Christ didn't want it. Last but not least, we connect prayer with forgiveness. An unforgiving spirit actually hinders and stops our prayers. Forgiveness must come from our heart while we pray. Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty five, When ye stand, pray and forgive, if ye have ought against him, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive you of your trespasses. I'm sorry, this is what the book says. You will not have your prayers answered if you harbor ill feelings, unforgiveness. He will not hear. He calls along and he begins to give a parable in Matthew 8. 18, 23, therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain king which would take an account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, with, reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But as far as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, his wife, his children, all he had, payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down, worship him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out, found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. He laid hands on him, took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what thou owest. His fellow servant fell down at his feet, besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. He would not. He went and cast him to prison until he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw that was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto the Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all thy debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not that thou also had compassion on thy fellow servant even as I had pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. This forgiveness business is a, is a hard thing sometimes when you have been wounded to the quick to the soul. When somebody that you really thought a lot of, family member, you have to reach down. And I'll, I'll, I'll guarantee you to say you, you may have to pray and ask God, Lord, I know I have to forgive. I understand it with my mind. I understand it with my knowledge. But Lord, I'm, I'm having a, a rough time wrestling with this and you're going to have to help me and this is what happened to Job. The Bible said he prayed for his friends. Mm -hmm. And that's when there was a turnaround in his life mm -hmm. when he prayed for those friends. Mm -hmm. Those friends that sat for seven days and looked at him. And the whole time, the biggest part of, of the writing, writing of Job is they're asking and, and trying to pick out and trying to find out where he went wrong. Or he went wrong. But when he prayed for him, God began to replenish. You see, when folks do you wrong, they're not forgiven from their debt to God until they ask. But when you forgive them of what they've done to you, you release yourself yeah. to go on down the road 
to go on down the road and live for God. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, sir. Because unforgiveness holds you back to the past and never really lets you go forward. I say, God, help me. Help me to pray and help me to forgive. Because if I can't forgive, because you see the man that got a hold of his fellow servant, he owed his Lord a tremendous amount. And it was impossible for him to, for, to pay it out. But you know what the Lord said? I forgave you. Why? Why? Read it. Why? Amen. Let me see if I can quickly. Lord, call. Oh, thou wicked. I forgave thee all thy debt because thou desirest. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. You wanted me to forgive it, so I done it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But in return, there was a friend that needed your forgiveness of a debt and you refused to do it. That's right. Mm -hmm. And what he owed you was, was pence, was meager compared to what you owed me, but I forgave you. Right. I canceled that. Yes, sir. I canceled that debt. Hallelujah. We need prayer and forgiveness. So quickly, let me just say Amen. The connectives. We need obedience, the armor of God, faith, persistence, fasting, and forgiveness. We need these things connected to prayer. Amen. Can we stand and raise our hands and love him today? God, I appreciate you for what you've done.